didn't know if Ron was gonna come up and introduce us again or not, but um, Brent Stanford's my name. And uh, it's, it's, always, it's always fun for me to be able to come home, especially to be in this building and see all the oil industry employees and executives here. And, and it's one of my favorite things to thank you all for this. Thank you for your investment in North Dakota, your investment in jobs, bringing the jobs to our state, especially to this corner of the state. And, and just give yourselves an applause for what you have built here. This would not have been built without this industry. So thank you so much. And we're probably ahead of schedule because there hasn't been enough politicians speaking today, so I'll try to keep us on schedule. Uh, my job today is to continue with what we started uh, on the stage the last few minutes and, and talk about Bach and Grow and the opportunity that we see going forward. And we're going to have the most important part of this presentation, the pilot employers up here next, and we'll lead them through a, a couple of different questions so you can try to get an idea of what it might mean for your company, what it means for the industry. And again, like Ron said, maybe what does this mean for the job market in North Dakota, maybe even a solution for this country. We're at full employment as a nation. There's no one that doubts that. I don't know how the Fed is going to get unemployment to go to three or four, three and a half or four and a half percent with how full employment we really are at. So, I mean, this is something where it's not like 2010, 11, 12, when it was 10 percent unemployment and people were coming to Waterford City and Dickinson and Williston and Minot looking for a job. This has become very tight, a very tight job market. We're stealing from our, our fellow competitors, we're borrowing between competitors, borrowing from other states, and it's just not like it was 10 years ago. So this was an opportunity that Ron seized upon. He was, he was, he was engaged by an immigration law firm in Alaska who said, I, I think I have an idea, something might work for the Bakken. And it's bringing in Ukrainians under United for Ukraine. Well, what does that mean? So we started with, what does this mean? Ron, like he said, he asked me, hey, you might want to be interested in listening to this project. It might be something you'd like to help out with. And so it was, it's from the ground up of what does it mean? What does Uniting for Ukraine mean? What does, what does humanitarian parole mean? We've learned a lot of new terms within that legal immigration side of the world. I want to I stress the legal immigration side of this world. All we hear about is the frustrations of the illegal immigration side. But I can tell you our country is really bad at the legal immigration side. This is a rare opportunity where folks are able to come from the Ukraine and go right to work. They don't have to wait for months and months and months to get employment authorization documents. They can go to work immediately. So it becomes a workforce solution. So Ron and the executive committee felt like this is actually a very innovative workforce solution opportunity. So what is it, so what is it gonna look like? And we started in the middle of March, and it's six months later. It took us until May to figure out we have to have sponsors. How do we get sponsors? Uh, we need employers that are interested. Who are the pilot employers? So two months was planning, learning the terms, learning what it might look like, who the employers are that would be interested, who we can find to be sponsors for these individuals. I have to tell you, sponsoring needs to have another word. It's more like supporting, a supporter of the program. It is not a financial sponsor. There's no financial obligation. It's actually signing up with the Immigration Service to be a supporter of the project, to bring someone here from the Ukraine. And so we'll talk, a couple of the folks on the stage are, are sponsors as well. But um, working through that took us until May, and then we engaged with the recruiting firm and the immigration law firm, ended up with resumes of individuals, 25 to start. We've run to our second group of 25 resumes of Ukrainian individuals that are qualifying from their side. They've already either served in the military or they have four children, but their government is allowing them to leave. If you think of the fact that there are somewhere between seven and 10 million Ukrainians that are officially refugee status, this is a humanitarian disaster happening right now in, in Liliana's home country. And, and so, so there, there's more than enough people interested in coming to the United States. From as far as we can tell, 150 to 200,000 people maybe have come so far under these different programs for Ukrainians. So there are a lot of people ready to come. But sponsoring and how you fit this into your employment is the real challenge. Um, so where we're at today is we do have 15 pilot employers and some of them are pilot 2.0. There were four initial pilot employers that received 10 uh, Ukrainian immigrants uh, in, on July 10th. Two employers in Minot, two employers in Dickinson, and, and you'll see that on the screen. ND Energy, Barranco Brothers in Dickinson, and Sanpro and Nukoda in Minot. And I have to tell you, just a little sidebar, with Carter and Liliana speaking, we wouldn't have been able to do this without them. We do not have 
the nonprofits. We do not have the government agencies in the western part of the state that are geared up to help with legal immigration. And so we knew who does everything in the West. It's the chambers and economic developers. But we really needed someone that could help with the language. So Liliana, thank you so much. And if, and if Yulia was here, and I know Chuck was hoping Yulia would be able to be here. If Yulia and Liliana weren't there for us on July 10th, I don't know how this would have worked. What happens is the translators in, in, they end up talking to these folks before they come. After they get here, the community liaisons and the consultants meet them at the airport with the employer. This is, this is, this is all in. This is greeting them with open arms. It's a little bit more than you would on hiring other, employer and other employees. So there's a caution here. This is not that simple or everyone will be doing it. But I hope what you can hear from these three is that it's worth it in the end. The loyalty, the gratitude, the work ethic, I, the best thing would be to have our 35 Ukrainian workers standing on this stage and telling you how great it is, but they all want overtime. They don't want to come and do something like this. They want to be working, getting paid, and so that's not really realistic. But to hear from these employers, um, they've all stepped up in different ways. I also want to caution that it's not, it's not for every company, every situation. You'll hear from three different situations here. More professional type employee needed, um, the ability to put folks in the shop for a while and then out on the field. And then Chuck has a, a more unique situation than that. If Glenn Baranko was here, Glenn was like the perfect storm. He's half Ukrainian. He has all kinds of job openings. He's got a couple folks out driving equipment today that are able to operate independently driving loaders and equipment like that. But his company has a broad, a broad spectrum of, of jobs and positions. So it, it's not something for everyone. But before I use up all of our time, I'm going to move on and, and start with uh, Josh. So Josh Blackaby, Sampro is a perfect example of how this can work. If you've, got, if you've got the ability to make the local decision, it can be the ownership, the local ownership, local management making this decision and, and jump into something that's a little bit different um, and you have a need for employees. Josh told me at one point, I need to hire 100 people. I'm not gonna be able to do that. I can't, keep, I can't keep above water with my current employee base the way it is now. I need to hire 100 more people. I need to bring in more people into, the, into this equation. So, so Josh sees a little bit, of, see, he sees this as an example of what that might look like in, in, the, in a small part of that. So um, Josh Sanpro, go ahead. How, how do you, what do you think of your, what are your initial reactions to the program from the airport to now? Um, let them know what you're doing for housing. I mean, it's very generous. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then if you could just end with, with the long-term view that you have. Perfect, thank you. Thanks for, for everyone that's made this program successful too. It's um, in, in a lot of part with the Mine IDBC and, and Chamber of Commerce, they stepped up tremendously uh, to help us out. I, I always said I had the easy job because I had to work. It was all the stuff that the NDPC and Reba and <clears throat> Ron working with, with lawyers and immigration and then you know the community uh, rallying around it that was the hard part. But I, you know my business, it works great for my business because we have a shop. You know, I have a, a shop that, you know, it's about rebuild and, and, and um, build shop uh, to prepare for, for, for practice leads that go out um, in the valve industry. So, you know, I have 32 people around the clock. I'm able to get the Ukrainians in. They come, they work in the shop. I can, you know, make sure that they work safely before we get them out to the field. So I, it's like it's, it's a perfect <clears throat> model for, for how this works because obviously, you know, uh, you know we were all very concerned with, with the language barrier. And, and with the language barrier is safety, which is, you know, important to every single one of these, these folks out here and, and all of our, our clients that we work for. So, um, you know, there was a lot of apprehension at first. I was nervous, you know. Like Kelly, we went up to the airport to, to greet the guys. But um, after meeting them, um, you know, though, I was, though, those fears went away really fast. And getting them out to work in the shop, it, it's been tremendous. They, it's beyond, it's met my expectations and, and well beyond for sure. Um, and I say that because, you know, they're not just good workers. They're, they're just wonderful people. And I feel like it's, it's they, they have North Dakota values that go back 50 years, if that makes sense. It's, it's just it's the different values. They want to work. And I'll give them an example, example of this. Um, Andre, one of our, our first ones that arrived in June, um, you know, I, I've been... I've put them, been putting them up in hotels. We're getting a house that they want to stay together. We're getting a big house for them that they can all stay together. Uh, they will be moving in in the next couple of weeks. But, um, you know, since June, we've been keeping them into, you know, a, a, a mainstay where they have a kitchen and all that fun stuff. 
Well, you know, I had told him at first, I said, don't worry about anything. We'll provide your transportation, your housing, et cetera. Well, two weeks ago, he approached me, and he goes, he goes, he goes Josh, Josh, I, I want to pay for my housing. I don't, I don't want you to pay for it anymore. You know, that's just a prime example. Like, he came to me, approached me, and said, I want to pay for my housing. I don't want you to pay for this anymore. I've got some paychecks under my belt now, and it's, I want to pay. So he's not looking for a handout. Um, and, and as Brent said, these guys would work 12-hour days constantly, nonstop. They tell me all the time, we don't have family here. We just want to work, work, work. Um, and their worth ethic, ethic is, is absolutely phenomenal. I'm, I'm excited about the second phase of getting them out. Um, you know, a lot of work for a lot of the operators in the room, getting them out on your guys' locations. Before that, you know, I've got a six-month plan in the shop, so they understand the valves, they understand the safety, making sure they're, they understand everything, and then start trickling them out to the field. Um, you know, and, and as I trickle, trickle them out to the field, I want to replace them with, with more Ukrainians in the shop because um, they're, they're, it's, been a, it's been a great program so far. Thank you, Josh. So uh, another similar example would be ND Energy, but I have to give Chuck kudos. Chuck was one of our first sponsors. Um, Kate Black is probably in the room, and Kate was the first and wasn't doing it to get employees. And so Kate needs a round of applause too. This because how it tur this turned out is, is well, the question of who should the sponsors be? Can it be companies? No, it can't. It has to be individuals. And so can it be Ron and I? Who, sh who should this be? It can be anyone, but what it's turned out that the best, the best path that we can find is that there, there's actually two paths. Minot put together service clubs where service club members were kind of competing between themselves of, okay, we can have sponsors here from the Lions Club and from the Rotary Club and then they're sponsoring individuals, and, and then the, 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 the companies don't, don't have to end up being involved in that part. But in Dickinson, it ended up being such that ownership and management ended up being the sponsors themselves. So Chuck was one of our first sponsors. And ND Energy also um, has, has hired recruit, recruiting from, from within the, the, the realm of, of uh, friends and relatives of, of their Ukrainian workers as well. And Chuck also has helped to bring some family members here. So Chuck's, Chuck's got a good story to tell. Could you tell us um, what, how it's turning out compared to your expectations and also a little bit about the sponsoring, if you could? Well, again, it's a team effort uh, by every stretch of the imagination to have the community involved and, and the help from uh, the Petroleum Council and then uh, the local people in I can't say enough about our translator, Yulia. Without her, it, we would have been stumbling uh, far more than we did. And so, um, again, I can't say, express my appreciation for everybody involved. Uh, our Ukrainians, immigrants, go into the water transfer program, and um, maybe by accident, we were fortunate enough to immigrate basically two at a time. Typically one had very good English and, and to offset the lack of uh, the uh, ability to speak English uh, on the part of the other immigrant, which helped tremendously as well. Uh, in the water transfer business, um, we probably entry level wise, maybe a little bit less safety concerns than other parts of the oil business. So that helped as well. We have a team approach on our water transfer team, so that helped as well to uh, kind of bridge the communication barrier when we had those two Ukrainians on that team and one could help the other. And uh, everything that we've experienced has been positive. In fact, I, talking to our management team, they, they said, if anything, these workers have stepped up the bar for the rest of our people. They don't uh, get involved in the drama that you sometimes get in the oil patch, and they uh, are very diligent in uh, keeping their nose to the work at hand. Most of our workers came from an Alaska cannery where they were working 16-hour days, and they would work for four hours straight, get a 15-minute break, work another four hours and have uh, lunch, and then do the same thing in the afternoon. And I asked them, did you get to see any part of Alaska? Did you go get to go fishing? What'd you do in your time off? And they said, we slept. So when they got a chance to see what they were doing and go out 
in the field and know that they were going to be laying pipe and actually be outside and driving a pickup. This looked uh, pretty inviting to them, and they're very appreciative of the, f of the work that they're able to do. Uh, somebody mentioned, you know, that they, they definitely want to work. Uh, when we uh, were bringing the Ukrainians in and uh, we found out wh what their travel experience had been the previous couple of days, they were traveling across Europe in a train and then got into a, a plane and basically, you know, spent two days of travel. A couple of our, our uh, immigrants ended up in the Denver airport overnight. And so the first thing that we did was to give them the next day off to kind of recover. And I, I think all of them probably would have went to work if they had the chance. So they're definitely committed uh, to the job and appreciative. And uh, it's been a breath of fresh air. I, I do recruiting for the company. And uh, it's like if you were recruiting, like somebody said 50 years ago, the values the morals, the appreciation is just, it's been outstanding. How about sponsoring? Could you give a little bit of an input on sponsoring? Is, is it breaking the bank? Are you having to give up too much financial information? I mean, there's a lot of fears. People read, they read what it is to be a sponsor for a refugee for humanitarian parole, and it's daunting. It actually, it's pretty easy. Um, we sent a copy of our most recent tax return uh, basically, I think it was more verification than anything else. Uh, and, you know, the first time you go through the process and the website, I'm not going to say it's easy, uh, but with the help and support that we had, it, it wasn't uh, that difficult, actually. And we were able to get, uh, you, you know, the information in on a timely basis, and it seemed like... Uh, that part of it was uh, fairly easy. My wife and I uh, took on sponsoring the wife and, and daughter of one of the workers who were from Odessa. And yet if you follow what's going on there, about a month ago, uh, Odessa was considered to be a fairly uh, safe place to live until you know the grain ports issue came up and, and basically there was uh, a war broke out there. We found out here recently that uh, we've been approved to bring them over. And so that's pretty exciting to reunite uh, the wife and child of one of our workers uh, with, with him. So, um, But it, it's really been a great experience. I'm not saying that we knew what we were doing. A lot of it was, you know, uh, Figuring things out that day with the help of Yulia, it uh, made it obviously easier. And then with the help of the Petroleum Council and your staff, it's it's been uh, a great experience. And uh, it just, I think, gives the community and gives the company a very good uh, feeling to be able to help somebody outside of just giving somebody a job. Thanks, Chuck. And I have to give a shout out to Becky Ness. Chuck could tell you, if you're behind on your paperwork for sponsoring, Becky will get you in line. We have a gal named Raina that works at the law firm, and she interfaces with Becky, and we know, the, we know the status. We know that if it's holding up getting the employees here because, well, the sponsors need to get their information in. So it's a well-oiled machine. We've got all these parts down, but thank you for that. It's, it means a lot more for you to say it than for us, and, and it's... Uh, it's not as arduous as it seems, but it, it seems like the overall picture of it is the government has this set up where they require a sponsor, period. Even if it's not something where you're going into a, a home, it's not, it's not like bringing in a college exchange student or, or a foster child of any means. This is just a matter of saying, I vouch for these people coming on this program, and, and you have the capacity. Then they, they check out financial capacity of you can support a person, and they deem that to be $28,000 per year of annual income to be able to support one person. So the next phase of this is hopefully some of the workers can sponsor friends and family as well. Um, next one we'll, we'll ask here is Kathy. So Kathy uh, was on the initial conversations. Kathy's an employer that, that doesn't have the shop environment and the water transfer. So Kathy is, is saying we need to have a professional recruit. We need to have, you know, ideally we have engineers, we have geologists. I mean, there can be a person operating on their own uh, generally, so it, it's it's not as easy of a fit. Um, but Kathy um, has one employee here today, um, has sponsored, 
as well, and, and you know, be interested to hear what, Kathy, what you have to say to the folks, because it's, it's not for everyone, but there still could be a place. Well, thank you, Brent. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this, uh, this, this process and, and this work. Uh, my situation is a little bit different. We are geologists, engineers. Most of our workers work on their own, as you're saying. However, the situation, so I was not on the first wave with Josh and, um, you know, in July. My worker came, Irina Reznichenko. She came to Minot, flew in on August 15th. Thank you to Liliana for visiting and meeting her at midnight at the Minot Airport. I met her the next morning at the Grand International Hotel. Our concern was the language um, to begin with, knowing that, especially since the work I had lined up was um, as a gate guard. And thank you to Hess Corporation, Brent Lonis, and to Joel Noyes for ass assisting with this. We now have Irina. The first thing we did when, she, when I met her at the hotel is number one, a cup of coffee. Um, number two was, let's get the cell phone working. So, I mean, they were, the, they were the first cell phones. So that was the first thing we did. We went to the Verizon store, got the cell phone working. Um, it's a different situation. We've been very, very careful. My concerns, of course, were language. Can she drive? I am still, you know, uh, we're still working on these things. So we're about a month into it. And just so everybody knows, it's, it's, the bottom line is it's well worth the effort to do this for the same reasons as the guys here is that she is so thankful. She has a husband back in Odessa, Ukraine. She has a daughter, you know, with a boyfriend. Um, she keeps in touch with them. She is going through, she has gone through all the safety training. Right now she is working as the third person on a two-man crew as a gate guard. These are 12-hour shifts that these women um, and guys work, but we, we have a couple of women. I guess the opportunity came, you know, to me was that we had three women through this program um, come, av come available and interested, and of course it was a natural fit. I am a uh, certified woman-owned business, yep. so it made sense to bring, you know, bring the gals over to work with Kathy, and thank you so much to Becky and to Reva and to everyone who did the vetting process, because out of those first three people, we found out that two of them didn't quite have the language skills that they professed that they did. And thank you so much for vetting that. We found out that one, Irina, I would put her somewhere about 80% um, on her language skills. So she's pretty good. Um, we can obviously communicate. We are taking care of, um, I have been a driver's ed teacher for the, for the last um, couple of weeks now. We really, she really wants to get her driver's license. She was able to take her, her written test in Russian. The state of North Dakota is absolutely fabulous. They have a whole list of languages you can take that written test in. She did that over in Williston. Um, we do not have, obviously, a liaison in Tioga. Um, Tioga is a little bit further out there, and I'm going to get to know Anna over in Williston really well because I met her yesterday. Um, Brent, we're going to be putting, and Joel, we're going to, she's going out to a drilling rig, working 12-hour shifts. When we are comfortable with the point that Arena will be able to manage that, that job on her own, and we're, I figure she's probably about two weeks away from that, Irina will go out and she will work a shift. It's reading a script, it's, it's monitoring and logging people, it's safety certifications of people coming on to different locations, drilling rig, frack site, coil tubing unit, um, sites, so um, the work fits quite well for, for this skill set that she's coming with. Um, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be part of the process. Um, I am a sponsor, a new sponsor, so I don't really, haven't gotten into all the, the ins and outs of that yet, but I do want, you know, one thing, Brent, that was asked of me, and I have to, I might as well bring it up because I think it's a valid question, why are you doing this with our, our Ukrainian workers when we have Americans who need jobs? And that's a fair question. I thought the same thing. Why, why, why bring I've read letters to the editor in the Minot Daily News, you know. They're not very nice letters, to be honest with you. But, but what I look at is I'm, I'm a kind of person who is all of the above. I say, you bet, I am hiring every American U.S. worker I can find, and we still have open job, job listings right now at Nesset. We have a variety of different jobs that we provide to the oil and gas industry. I am a service company. 
not an operator, but a service company. And to be able, you know, for us, Brent, to be able to bring Americans in from other states, absolutely. But we can also do this and assist these Ukrainians who are at our doorstep asking to come and work here. And I think it's a great program. Thank you, Kathy. And it's, it's something where it's adding more people into a very a system of full employment in the, in the entire country is important to point out. But I have a question. Do you have other applicants for this, these gate guard positions? Evidently, you're, you don't have a revolving door or you don't have a full applicant line or else, or else you might not have had to do this program. Is that right? As far as I, I do have a list of applicants for, for the work. What we're finding out, and I'm sure other companies are finding the same thing, we have already hired the best of the best workers out there. We have already hired the middle of the road workers out there. We are now on to, you know how we talk tier one, two, and three? I don't know, you know, yeah. I, 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 I don't wanna, you know, belittle anybody or anybody's efforts here, but we might be into the tier three workers right now. And, you know, I'm not getting the commitment to the job from, from everybody be quite honest with you, um, you know, and, you know, the excuses of not to come to work, you know, you guys are saying you're, you're finding your workers are really, you know, they want to be there, they want to work overtime, so does Arena, um, but we have some other workers who are, oh my goodness, you know, my car broke down and I'm tired and I slept in and the football game is on and bam, 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 and I don't, <laughs> hey, wait a second, that rig is still drilling and we go 24 hours, 365, you know, we have to go to work. Um, I'm getting more of that cooperation, you know, from Arena, and I am getting a lot of turnover and a lot of turnover. So it's an ongoing, uh, that's why I go into all of the above for hiring. I think, yes, U.S. workers, North Dakota workers, regional workers, wherever you're coming from. But I also say that this United for Ukraine is a wonderful program, and I want to take part, of, part in it. Thank you for giving it a Amen. shot. Thank you. This is the real closer. <laughs> Amen. Kathy was lined up in the bullpen to be the closer. But, but Chuck, I have, I have to poke you one more time. So, so one of the conversations that we had early on with you and Jason Homiston was, was what is your recruiting looking like today? And Jason offered, it was kind of a funny analogy, but it went from 100 down to about two. Yeah, we bring in 100 people. And then you first X go off from drug testing, and then it's, you know, whatever it might be. You might end up with two or three people that actually get employed and then, and then oftentimes one of them leaves within a few weeks or months to go across the, the street. And so, so there's an investment to touch 100 people to get down to that point, I assume, is part of the reason why this might also be an option that makes some sense. Well, it, there's definitely a, a sorting process and then once you think that you have, you know, your 10 out of 100, obviously you alluded to it, you're lucky if they pass the drug test or if they stay long enough to get through training. So it, it is a, a challenge. And I, I guess maybe this is one of the benefits. It's like you don't even have to think about these people, whether they want to work or whether they're going to stay. It's, it's a, it, there's no question. And you know it not just because of their situation. You know it because of their appreciation for what you're doing for them. And uh, I know as a company, uh, it, the benefits of it have far outreached any investment we made in that. Right, and, and so, um, so the good part is that. The good part, you get someone here ready to work. We haven't talked about cost, but we're, we're, we're dialing that in as we go. It seems like it's gonna end up being about $4,500 a person, and that's your fees, your transportation from the Ukraine to the United States all of it paid, employment authorization, all, all the fees paid, $4,500. And so you have to think about that in terms of what do we pay for our hiring process the way it is now to get someone ready to work. But there's a but in the middle of that. You have to have a sponsor, which a sponsor in general, can one sponsor can generally sponsor five beneficiaries or so. So we need to think about that sponsor, um, bring in the NDPC sponsor so we can keep the program going. But second of all, it's, you've heard a little bits and pieces about what that first month looks like. And the first day, for some reason, these flights always come in between 10 and midnight. So, so Carter has been there at that time. Lilian has been there at that time. Josh has been there at that time. So it's a team approach from the time that they're here at the airport until 
not only those first days, but it's basically the first month, it sounds like, and maybe even more. But also think about it for yourselves. If you're going to get a job in the Ukraine, you probably want to have a buddy that can speak some Ukrainian. You probably want to figure, have a buddy that can help you or an employer help you. How do I get somewhere to live in this place? How do I, does my driver's license work in the Ukraine? So it's all the reverse. Some of them have driver's licenses that are eligible to drive for 60 days or so immediately. Some do not. But then if after that point, Kathy alluded to being a driver's ed instructor, they have to go through the same thing that our, six, that our, our 15 year olds do to go through, go through uh, the, 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 the certification, the tests, all, all that stuff. The same thing you do when you're a kid. They have to start from ground zero. But it can be taken in Russian, so that helps. Social security numbers, since most of these folks we're getting have this, this tie to the Alaskan law firm where they've worked in the fisheries, most of them have a social security number. They might not have their card, so it's another process. So, so there's, a pro, there's a process of cell phones, getting the SIM card changed out, going to figure out driver's license, figuring out social security number, let alone where they're gonna live. Now I know 12 to 15 years ago, most of you were providing some kind of crew camp housing. Today it's surprising how many employers say, no, we don't do anything for housing. And that's good that we're at that point. Kudos to a lot of developers that added a lot of apartments and a lot of houses in this place. So in Wofford City, Wilson, Dickinson, mine at the last 12 to 15 years, Kildeer. Um, there are apartments to rent, but we're at a point where they don't have credit that we know of, so to get an apartment lease is gonna take a while. And I don't know if we know what that even looks like of what that time frame might be. Some solutions we've seen, Bronco was one of the first ones to rent an entire house, an older house that had five bedrooms. Josh said he's doing the same. They prefer to be able to be together. Until they get the family members here, they're fine with bunking up, with, with sharing a rental agreement and having less rent per month. It's something that we expect the employers would payroll deduct for that amount of money. Um, Glenn Bronco's story is, hey, I'm renting a house for $1,600 a month. Five of them are living there, $320 a piece. It works. Same thing with cars. They probably don't have credit to go down the street and buy a car. Cars are pretty expensive today, but their goals are to get their own place to live, get their own car. But in the meantime, I know Glenn has also shared with me, yeah, I'm actually borrowing the money to them, a couple of them, I, don't, I mean, at one point it was two or three are in, in the process of buying cars and, and Glenn is actually borrowing the money. So it's, it's kind of back to what it looked like to me 12 to 15 years ago for the, in this case. But what you're getting is someone that wants to work that over time, they're very grateful. What we hear from the Alaska employers, they're not jumping around. They actually feel so much gratitude for these folks getting them here and giving this opportunity and for employing them and helping out with housing, helping out with the vehicle, that, that, the, that they're, they're likely to stay longer. Um, Josh and I were just talking outside about time frame. So United for Ukraine is a two-year time frame. Most of these, these work visa programs are, are seasonal, four to six months. Um, you'll see folks working in Medora. You'll see for, folks working on the farms in the summertime that are four to six months. Concrete crews in Fargo, four months, three months, and they're, they're very expensive. It might be $15,000 for just three or four months. This is... But this is not work visas, this is humanitarian parole. What they're given for sure is two years. There was, there was a release by the immigration service by the US government that this has been extended to three. We don't have confirmation of that. But Josh, and I know Glenn Broncos in the same boat have already expressed to me, I wanna keep them longer than that. What do we do to get moving forward? So, so there will be another chapter to this. There are other ethnic groups that have been allowed to stay in the United States when they're coming from a war-torn environment like this that end up with, with amnesty, they end up with the ability, to, with asylum, I guess, not amnesty, asylum. They end up with asylum because they're coming from a war-torn environment. So then it's a permanent citizenship. So that is one thing that could happen because of the ongoing war in the Ukraine, but we don't know. So these employers are taking a little bit of a leap of faith in that it might be a two-year window to this. But if our normal turnover is more than, you know, is more than that, then it, it's, it's a risk worth taking. Um, so let's, let's go into, um, I, should, I should give a number. Did we give the number? We, have, we do have 35 Ukrainians that will be placed here within the next couple of weeks. And, and we're, our goal is to get to 100 by the end of the year. Um, what that's going to mean is that we need to have um, other employers see this as the opportunity and then more sponsors come online. And, you know, it's up to you. This is not something that make or, makes or breaks the NDPC office or myself on this, on this job. Um, we, we've, put it, we've put it together, we've figured it out, we know how the process works from start to finish, we're learning things as we go, 
One of the irritating things is they, they have to go for a biometrics exam, which sounds so daunting in Fargo. Can't, Fargo. Be, can't be any closer than Fargo. Rapid City. Or Rapid <laughs> City. Yeah, they gave us a break and said, how about Rapid City? But this is the federal government. Um, you know, it's out of Minneapolis, and they're making a the decision. The closest you can go is Fargo. It's a 10-minute blood test to go all the way to Fargo. And to this point, they were not scheduling all in a row. So you're, one person's Friday, one person's Monday. We're in, and so, so we've, got, we've been talking with Kramer's office. Jody Link is really being a leader on this. She's, she's got a new solution she wants to share with Reba. I can't wait to hear what it is. But we're arguing for there should be able to use the FBI office in Williston or something for blood tests and fingerprinting. I guess it's the fingerprinting. If it's fingerprinting, why, why can't law enforcement do this? So we're finding out the irritating little pieces and trying to get those resolved. Um, but in the end, it's about if this works as an opportunity to bring in new workers into the oil field and, and um, you know, go through the housing and the driver's license and all that for the first month and um, help out with finding some sponsors. And if, if the industry feels that this makes sense and works, then Bach and Grow will continue. And, and it's, we purposely named it Global, global Recruitment of Oil Field Workers, um, not only because Brady Pelton came up with a really great acronym, but because we wanted to make sure it was agnostic to which country. People ask all the time, why are you only doing Ukrainians? Well, that's because the federal government today is giving an exception for Ukrainians through humanitarian parole, through being able to work immediately with their I-94 documents. They don't need to have their employment authorization document, which normally takes takes 90 days minimum for these individuals. It takes 90 days for our people to get their EADs, but they can work in the meantime. This is, a, this is the federal government opening up an opportunity for Ukrainians only. There's other countries that have similar treaties with the United States. Their people can come in on humanitarian parole, but they don't get the same ability to work immediately. So it becomes really labor intensive and dollar intensive and the nonprofits and the government agencies are the ones doing that work. So this is unique today, but we'll be ready for whatever other unique programs might come along. All right, um, how are we doing for time? Good. All right, um, any closing comments? We, um, we covered sponsors, we covered that first month, we've covered what does it look like um, for the future. Um, Josh didn't say give me 90 more people, this is something you can't just say, yeah, I'm ready to take 100 people. This is more methodical, gotta make sure everyone's safe, the language is, is, um, is good. The um, ability to go work is good. We're, we're dialing this in from our office standpoint as well of testing out those English skills beforehand. We want to get Liliana to be able to have a conversation with people before we're making the call of, yeah, bring them here. And, and so we're, we're trying to dial in that English part of it because that, that is the main concern. So we're getting better as it goes along. I will say it's a true opportunity to, for the workforce challenges that we're facing. This, this is an opportunity. Um, so if you guys, and I know a lot of you are, having workforce challenges, um, go chat with Becky because it, it, this is a, it's a true solution and it, it gets me excited thinking about it. So, All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for our three panelists and pilot employers. Appreciate your hard work and your, your efforts. Thank you.